Seth Waxman has served as both an assistant U.S. attorney here in Washington and a criminal defense attorney. Joins us now to take your legal questions about Paul Manafort and Michael Cohen and their cases. And I want to start with the charges that uh, seem to have garnered the, the most attention, the campaign finance violations that Michael Cohen pled guilty to. Can you explain uh, the exact uh, laws that he broke uh, and why uh, this seems to be the, the, uh, the charges that are getting the most attention? Sure. Well, campaign finance laws provide limits on campaign contributions, so the, the system is transparent, so the American public can see who's contributing and for what reasons, and or not necessarily what reasons, but how much. And so if an individual contributes over a certain limit, $5,000 or so, then that needs to be reported, if corporations donate, and, and the like. So it's all for transparency's sake. And the laws that were broken here is that there was a $130,000, $150,000 payments that were funneled through Michael Cohen. Uh, to the porn star, to a mistress, and obviously not reported. Uh, and obviously, Michael Cohen has pled guilty to those crimes. So, President Trump tweeted yesterday that the Obama campaign had campaign finance violations that were t a k e n care of due to a fine. Why was that a fine? Why is this a, a guilty plea in a federal court? Sure, it's really apples and oranges, the two different instances. Uh, there was no allegation that President Obama was in any way individual. involved in those campaign finance um, missteps. Uh, those were more technical violations that, you know, there's a reporting requirement within 48 hours that campaign contributions need to be reported. That wasn't done. Um, An individual donor or two did not report their uh, donations properly. In fact, Mr. Trump had those same kind of issues come up, and he was, uh, those people were just resulted in fines. So those similar things here. In Mr. Trump's case, you have an individual who was involved funneling money through in kind of uh, surreptitious ways, and, and that's what Mr. Cohen's pleading guilty to. So what sort of legal exposure does this create for President Trump in your mind? Well, it's a, it's, that's a difficult question. You know, the, a, there's a, a good debate on whether a sitting president can be indicted. I'm of the opinion that he cannot, that the Constitution was set up for impeachment proceedings to handle removing a president. An individual federal prosecutor with 12 jurors should not upend uh, this country's election decisions. Um, there's a debate on the other side of that. Some very well thought out legal scholars disagree. Um, so I think the legal exposure for Mr. Trump really result, can be in impeachment proceedings. The plea deal, is this usually a precursor for more cooperation down the road? Yeah, this is a really unusual um, situation here. I've really never seen an individual go in, plead straight up essentially to eight counts um, without an agreement in the, on the table. To me, he's not cooperating at this time. Mr. Davis, his lawyer, has said as much that he's willing to come in. Uh, that idea, you know, a cooperator will typically pick one key charge for him to plead to, or if there's two or three different disparate kinds of conduct, maybe one from each group. So there may be three different counts, you know, tax evasion, bank fraud, and campaign. But to have eight counts involved, to me, indicates he's not cooperating as of today, as we sit here. Seth Waxman with, with us until about 8.30 this morning, taking your calls and questions if you have them about uh, either the Michael Cohen case, the Paul Manafort case. Now would be a good time to call in. Republicans, it's 202-748-8001. Democrats, 202-748-8000. Independents, 202-748-8002. And I want to change track to the Manafort conviction. Uh, how did you read that conviction uh, on eight charges of the 18 uh, that he was originally charged with? Yeah, that's, that's a sweeping victory for the government. It's not all counts, but it's major counts. He's facing significant jail time. Given his age, it could be tantamount to a death sentence, essentially. So, you know, as a prosecutor, a former prosecutor, you'd like to get, you know, all 18 counts. Obviously, we're hearing from at least one of the jurors that was a lone holdout. That happens. But at the end of the day, these are significant convictions, and it achieved what I think is the government's primary goal uh, was to try to flip Paul Manafort. And do you think that's going to happen now? I mean, we had an entire conversation in the last hour about a potential uh, pardon from the president. Uh, do you think that's something that Paul Manafort is holding out for? Um, so in every case I've ever been involved in under these kinds of circumstances, 100%, I would say. There's really no other path for him. He's got to get a deal. He can't face 10, 20 years in jail. He could get a deal. The X factor, of course, is the pardon. And I, I don't think any expert that could be on your show or otherwise can really predict what Mr. Trump's going to do in that regard. So walk us through the next steps for Paul Manafort, because it's a, a little bit confusing about what happens with these uh, eight 
uh, charges and then what he's facing in his case here in D.C. coming up next month. Yeah, so on the eight uh, charges of conviction, he'll face sentencing. Typically, that's 60 to 90 days out. In this case, because there's another case pending, the judge may push it to the after the conclusion of that trial. So, you know, there'll be a report generated. The judge will get advice from both sides, and he'll sentence under a sentencing guideline regime that's kind of complicated. But some in substance, he could be facing anywhere from 10 to 20 years, depending how the judge stacks the case, crimes. And then he'll have the D.C. trial in the fall, and he'll walk in and be subject to a new jury. Do those 10 other charges that the jury couldn't come to a conclusion on, uh, do those just go away? Does the Mueller team ever try to try those down the road? Um, well, they have the option. They can ask the judge to retry those cases, or charges rather. Whether they will practically do so uh, depends on one, if he cooperates, two, if he gets a pardon, and then three, just uh, judicial resources and prosecutorial resources. You know, if they go forward with the D.C. trial first, um, and they get convictions there, they may say, look, this guy's now facing 30 or 40 years. Do we really need to retry him on 10 more counts? Probably not. Seth Waxman with us to take your questions this morning. Uh, you served as an assistant U.S. attorney here in D.C. Uh, and uh, as I understand, you also uh, argued cases in front of the same judge that Manafort appeared in front of? I've been in that courthouse not arguing in front of Judge Ellis. I, I, I've been in status hearings, but not actually a trial. Uh, tell us how, your thoughts on how Judge Ellis performed in that case. Yeah, he clearly was an active judge, obviously giving his advice and, and opinions at times. I think he crossed the line a couple times, frankly, when he comments on a witness and the credibility of a witness that's really not the judge's role you know in my experience I've been in front of a lot of very active judges as long as the judge doesn't cross the line and give the jury the impression that the prosecutors are playing unfair or doing things underhanded I mean jurors react very very badly to that if they get the feel that the the government's playing fast and loose so I don't think he did that um, and maybe that's why we saw some convictions in this case Seth Waxman uh, a lawyer with experience uh, both in the prosecution and on the defense side so let's take some calls Terry in Woodbridge, Illinois, Republican. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to ask a couple of questions. On a president campaign, isn't it true that a president can spend whatever amount of money that he wants on his own campaign? And isn't it true that when it comes to businessmen, that they usually do have lawyers that handle certain things for them, like, for instance, people trying to get free money from them and everything? And isn't it true that he did pay that money back to his lawyer and his lawyer usually bills him as expensive counts and everything? Terry, thanks for the questions. Yeah, very good questions. And there's a lot of controversy over a lot of the things that um, are being said. Mr. Giuliani essentially offered up the same um, comments as your caller. Uh, the reality of it is, is that while a campaign, a candidate can spend as much as they want on their campaign, they would have to disclose that. Um, and so there would be accountability in that regard. And when you look at this matter, you know, the money that he, um, that Mr. Cohen paid at Mr. Trump's direction, according to Mr. Cohen, was done for payment to porn stars and for mistresses. You know, if this were funds that were used to build uh, campaign signs for people's yards or put a billboard up on the side of a building, you'd say, well, maybe the, the lawyer was acting as an agent and it was like, look, I just don't have the cash in my checking account right now. Do you mind front and I'll get you back? That isn't this kind of a situation. This, it, it, circumstantially, at least the government would say, right, is that the nature of this transaction circumstantially shows kind of a nefarious intent. And of course, Mr. Cohen testified to that in court and when he accepted his plea. And finally, this is Donald Trump's Justice Department. This isn't some rogue entity. This isn't some third party country that's doing this. I mean, these are political appointees of Mr. Trump. The head of the Southern District of New York is a person Mr. Trump appointed. So. You know, it's a little bit disingenuous for him to talk, call this a witch hunt when it's his own team that's bringing these charges. How often is the Justice Department pursuing felony campaign finance charges, just in general? Yeah, not not often. I mean, I'm not going to you know suggest to you that this is an everyday run-of-the-mill thing. When I was a federal prosecutor and my colleagues, there wasn't a single case here in D.C. where there was really this kind of intention on campaign finance. We're dealing with more typical bribery, you know, um, white-collar theft kind of crimes. Um, but that's not to say the laws aren't on the books and they shouldn't be enforced. They are. John Edwards is an example. There are many other cases where there are prosecutions for criminal conduct. It's simply not typically, you know, overspending on a campaign limit. Um, there, there's typically something much more involved when you bring criminal charges. To Highland, California, Connie, independent. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I, I just want to have a question. Uh, all this money that was paid to this prone stars or whatever they are, um, was it campaign money or was it Mr. Uh, President Trump's own money? And also, when Clinton was president, 
Okay, all this happened with that uh, uh, young lady. I can't remember her name, but and all this talk about impeachment. Now, why aren't they bringing all that up? Oh, that is so hush-hush. I'm sorry, but thank you. Sure. Uh, and so the first part of your question had to do with um, the payment to the porn stars, and was that campaign money or uh, President Trump's personal money? Um, more along the lines of President Trump's personal money. Uh, I think it came out of a, uh, a corporate fund, but there wasn't any suggestion that it came out of a you know um, PAC for Mr. Trump or some organization, a, a campaign organization. And I think she was referring to Monica Lewinsky on that side. I mean, there were impeachment proceedings with Mr. Clinton. Uh, so it did get to that point. Now, whether this rises to impeachment, you know, that's the debate we're in right now. Marsha in Englewood, Florida, Democrat, good morning. Good morning. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Waxman if there isn't anything suspicious about that one juror holdout for the 10 other charges, because um, Manafort had a reputation for witness tampering. He, I mean, he had an ankle bracelet, but he was still moving around. And it just seems extremely, based on what that woman said on the fax, on the Fox uh, News yesterday, that regardless how much the other 11 jurors tried to point out to her all the paper trail, and she just was flat out refused to accept it, I would be suspicious of a witness of a juror of that nature not having some kind of connection within the the uh trump party for non-fox news viewers uh the report out yesterday uh, special counsel robert Mueller's team was one holdout juror away from winning a conviction against paul manafort on all 18 counts of bank fraud and tax fraud according to juror pollard Paula Duncan uh, in an exclusive interview that took place yesterday. Sure, and, and with regards to the caller, you know, I understand the thought process there. I think that's really unlikely here for this simple fact. That juror did convict on eight counts, so if the fix was really in, if Manafort or someone else had really gotten to that juror, you would assume that juror would have held out on all 18 counts and there would have been a hung trial. So for whatever reason, and the logic behind it seems a little bit difficult for us to digest on the outside as to why this individual juror was willing to convict on eight counts, but not on the other 10. But I, I, don't, I don't see any indication of witness tampering or jury tampering here. Is the Mueller team, in, in your mind, doing some Monday morning quarterbacking on their jury selection process? after this interview? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, my thought before the verdict came out is that while Judge Ellis wanted to move this case quickly, and it's called the rocket docket, and I've been in that courthouse, so no question they move quickly, I think he went particularly too fast on jury selection. In a case of this magnitude, with this kind of political atmosphere, to pick a jury in a half a day, you really don't even get to hear a juror speak. Typically in a courtroom, the, the prosecution and defense would at least get to say, you know, ma'am or sir, what do you do for a living, and at least hear that person's voice. So I'd, I, I think they be wanting a longer jury selection process at a minimum. Why the rocket docket? Why yeah. does that court act that way? You know, it's a reputation. It's a good question as to where that or originated. I know there are judges, uh, Judge Bryan, and, and you know, has been on that courthouse for you know a very long time. It's a, a very reputable, uh, highly regarded court, uh, and they take their uh, speed p with which they uh, bring cases through very seriously. And frankly, I think it does a lot of good in most cases. Um, that sometimes prosecutors become too enamored with their evidence and start to believe you. The ex ultimate example of that is you know O.J. Simpson and Judge Ito. That is a no witness murder that should probably have taken a week or two. Judge Ellis may have tried that case shorter than an OJ documentary. <laughs> Bonnie's in Street, Maryland, a Republican. Good morning. Yes, I, I'm just, this with Stormy Daniels is ridiculous. She provided a service. She was overpaid for it, and it, it, that should be the end of it. And her lawyer, Abernathy, is more, nothing more than a walking billboard because she's making millions off of uh, stripping and providing her service. Got your point, Bonnie. Yeah, and look, what Stormy Daniels' background was in her conduct, you know, that's a separate question as to whether someone violated the law. You know, if Mr. Trump or Mr. Cohen, you know, fan, funneled campaign contributions essentially to Ms. Ms. Daniels or anyone else, despite what they may do for a career and despite how much mon money they're making off this, uh, you know, the just Justice Department will take cases and make charges where there's law and facts to support it. Do you think Mike, Michael Avenatti is a uh, good 
attorney for Stormy Daniels? Well, he's clearly a strong advocate, right? You can't deny the fact that he's out there. And, you know, in his case is unique. He's fighting fire with fire. You know, it's not my style so much, but, um, you know, he's, he's being effective. Charles, Charlotte, North Carolina, Republican. Go ahead. Morning, John. Mr. Mr. Waxman, it just seems like um, it, it seems like a sign of desperation to go back and look at white collar crimes that happened many years before the gentleman before the campaign to go after. It, it looks like that, that Mueller is squeezing anybody that has any connection with the Trump campaign uh, on unrelated charges. I mean, we're talking about taxi medallions. We're talking about uh, payments to Playboy models. But there is no Russian collusion after two years. I mean, we keep looking for something. I think that if we had squeezed the Clinton campaign and Tony Podesta and John Podesta and all these people around the Clinton campaign as hard and as tough as we are, everybody in the periphery, just to go after everybody and try to squeeze them for any information about missing emails, that we would have uh, an, uh, you know, a different outcome on that investigation. Also, with Chris Collins, Let's talk about Nancy Pelosi's insider trading. We let her go, and then here we are. Suddenly, we have telephone. Charles, and we start because because he's a, a supporter of Trump. So, Charles, we're going a little in and out there at the end, but I think we got your point. Yeah. Um. So, on the idea of desperation, look. In my opinion, you know, consp- in my experience, conspiracies don't drop out of the sky in the spring of 2016. There's a reason why the Russians were willing and felt comfortable to reach out to the Trump team. And the- there's a reason why the Trump team felt comfortable entertaining those calls. And oftentimes, in my experience, that's because there's a backstory. And what we saw in the Alexandria court, while not directly related to the months leading up to the election, could- can provide the background as to why a conspiracy starts and why people are comfortable working together. So I don't think it's completely um, disjointed or disconnected uh, what we heard in Alexandria from the Mueller investigation. And just one of the other points on squeezing individuals, I mean, I know that has kind of a pejorative sense to it, but that's what federal prosecutors do. I mean, if there's people that are caught up in criminal conduct and those people can provide information on other investigations, that's the meat and potatoes. That's how federal prosecutions work and how investigations occur. You know, it's in the context of the president potentially here, so it's obviously getting a lot of attention. But that is happening every day in every jurisdiction in this country right now as we sit here. The caller brought up Congressman Chris Collins. In your mind, who's got more to worry about legally, Congressman Chris Collins or Congressman Duncan Hunter? Wow, that's a tough, you know, (laughs) which one? Uh, You know, Mr. Collins or Congressman Collins, that seems to be a pretty lock solid case. On the other hand, and just, you know, knowing the details on the other matter, I would not want to be in either of those shoes. And, you know, as a defense counsel, you'll have to be pretty creative in both situations. Anthony is in Virginia Beach, Virginia, independent. Good morning. Good morning, John. Good morning, Mr. Waxman. Um, A couple of things. One, uh, those so-called ladies that uh, he had an agreement with, to me, it's nothing short of blackmail. If we agree to a contract, but you come out wanting to do something along those lines to me, clear up. That's blackmail. That's number one. And number two, um, my suspicion is... uh, Attorney Mueller is not going to find anything. Why do I say that? Because it's going to lead right back to maybe nothing short of uh, the former president. It's going to lead back to uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, It's going to lead back to the FBI. And that is not what they want. There is no way that they're going to find any collusion without it leading back to the original source. And that's where it's going to come to. Sure. So on the blackmail idea, um, you know, frankly, non-disclosure agreements are signed every day in this country, you know, by in all kinds of contexts. And might, we might, might not feel good about it, but people separate from their companies all the time and agree not to speak ill of individuals and agree not to bring any um, civil actions against them. That happens all the time. And, you know, that is, there are reasons why those may or may not be enforceable. I think we've heard a lot of from Mr. Avenatti on that point. But then as to, you know, the Mueller investigation not coming up with anything, I, you know, I, obviously that is a constant refrain. It's a witch hunt. It's, you know, a hoax. You know, what I would say to that just generally is we don't know. I don't think any of us know. Mr. Mueller is sitting on whatever evidence he's sitting on. I think that everybody should hold judgment until we get that report. And then we'd be educated and can offer up what I would consider more, uh, you know, a more pointed criticism or critique of whatever he has. That witch hunt refrain uh, came up again last night in the 1 a.m. hour on the East Coast from the President of the United States on his Twitter page. No collusion, rigged witch hunt was the President very late last night. Less than 10 minutes left. 
with Seth Waxman taking your questions uh, about the Manafort investigation and convictions uh, about the Cohen uh, guilty uh, plea this week. Uh, time for a few more calls. Republicans, it's 202-748-8001. Democrats, 202-748-8000. Independents, 202-748-8002 if you want to join the conversation. As folks are calling in, uh, I did want to ask about the, the Cohen guilty plea. Why was that case moved uh, through the Southern District of New York? What was the, the legal reasoning there? Yeah, so Mr. Mueller has a mandate to investigate Russia collusion, essentially, or a conspiracy in, in the leading up to the election. He obviously made a determination that this was significantly separate from that, that it was more properly prosecuted by a separate office. And what does that mean for what happens going forward? Are they still cooperating on evidence gathered and uh, what they can charge with, uh, depending on which court they're in? Yeah, 100%. Um, anything that any federal prosecutor do, does, they can share with others within the Justice Department, can share with state and local officials, um, you know, assuming there's an agreement there. But everything that's going on in the Southern District, we should all assume, is going right to Mr. Mueller's office, whether it's daily, probably more kind of measured out than that. Maybe they have a weekly call or something, unless there's something really momentous. But, you know, whatever's happening in SDNY is, is being funneled back to the Mueller investigation. Tom is in Clinton, Massachusetts, a Democrat. Good morning. Good morning. The uh, question I have, if money is speech and corporations are people, aren't governments people, and therefore isn't all of this unconstitutional? Can't people make uh, secret uh, 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 speech? And is uh, hacking a private uh, institution's email any different than recording a conversation in a private auditorium for donors? Uh, so, Mr. Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court, might we not see 5-4, the whole campaign contribution law, totally thrown out, thrown out as unconstitutional? What do you think? Some big legal questions there yeah, for you. Yeah, those are good ones. Um, so a government is not a person under the law. So there really are different regimes of legal standards. Um, and there is speech. You know, uh, donations have been determined um, to be speech um, for almost a mid-1970s now by the Supreme Court. And that does apply to people, individuals, human beings like you and I and your callers. It does apply to corporations, uh, different standards for government institutions. Um, and then the hacking uh, and recording a private conversation really kind of apples and oranges again. Um, hacking, of course, is you know, unauthorized intrusion into a computer system. You know, recording a conversation, some states you have to have both parties consent. Other states you can have one party consent. So the recordings by Mr. Cohen here in D.C. is a one party consent state. That's why there wasn't a law violated there. Uh, and in an open public environment like an auditorium, you don't have a right of privacy. So right now, this is being recorded. I don't have a right of privacy to this conversation. So um, I think, again, that's apples and oranges. On the one-party consent versus two-party consent for recordings, are most states one-party consent? Most states are one-party consent. I think there are about 12 or 13 states that are not. Maryland, for example, right outside here in the district, is a two-party consent state. So you could not... No, we couldn't record this conversation unless you knew it and I knew it. In D.C., I could have a tape recorder on me listen, you know, recording you right now and you couldn't do anything about it. When did that legal decision go back to in, in these states? Is this something that was set up uh, back in the uh, last century? After Alexander Graham Bell? I'm not really sure. Uh, that's a good question. I'd have to look into when, what, you know, when the states adopted these laws, why some did and one si why some didn't. My clients are always asking me, what can I do today? <laughs> Tina is in Cropwell, Alabama, Republican. Good morning. Gentlemen, good morning. And one party consent, who are you consenting with? Uh, that just seems folly. Let's, I have an observation in the question. It seems that every time President Trump speaks, there's an element of truth to what he says. And if he's trying to avoid something, wouldn't he be changing his story if he were lying? Then I have a question. If Mueller is investigating Russian collusion in our elections, where in the world is the investigation into the hacking of the Russians into the DNC computers, to John Podesta, to Uranium One with, with Hillary and Bill with them getting how much $225 million from the Russians? Please help me understand this. 
Sure. On the last question about the investigation more into the hacking into Podesta and the DNC emails, I think that very much is a part of what he's looking at. I mean, I think that's fundamental to a lot of what's going on. Obviously, those emails were part of the quote unquote dirt that was being offered on Hillary Clinton, potentially in exchange for a reduction or elimination of sanctions on Russians. So I think that is really in the heart of it. Um, and uh, and uh, the idea of, you know, wouldn't he, Trump be changing his story? I mean, I think, you know, it's fair to say that he does change his story a whole lot. And just, you know, not to be coy or flip about it, but as a former federal prosecutor, you know, that is, and, and, and prosecutors receive jury instructions on this from judges all the time. It shows consciousness of guilt. A jury is allowed to consider a changing story, a prior inconsistent statement to go to the state of the mind of the defendant if, you know, if someone was charged. So these changing stories, I think, are very difficult to digest for the American public. And from a prosecutor's perspective, is evidence. You're a former federal prosecutor. How many years did you do that? Uh, 13. And did you have a specialty? So half the time violent crime, half the time fraud, public corruption, the stuff that we're kind of talking about now. And why did you turn to criminal defense? Um, you know, I always wanted to try cases, wanted to be in the courtroom and do this kind of work. So it's been in interesting and no more interesting than we are right now to be able to talk to you about these sorts of things. And where do you work here in D.C.? Uh, Dickinson Wright, a law firm here in downtown D.C. And Seth Waxman with us for about five or six more minutes. Uh, Barbara is in Tennessee. Hermitage, Tennessee, a Republican. Good morning. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, either one of you, do you know what really started this off? It was when Mueller was turned down for an interview for a second go or a third go around, however long he was FBI director. But that was when he was turned down. And the very next day, Rosenstein and Mueller started this special investigation. And do you know that? And this has gone every direction but Russian collusion or whatever they intended it for. Yeah, no, I mean, that is a constant refrain we'll hear from especially advocates for the president and trying to be as independent and objective as I can. You know, I've, Mr. Mueller has a storied career. He's been a career prosecutor for decades. He was a decorated veteran, a, a war hero. Um, and I will tell you, he worked in the U.S. Attorney's Office here in D.C. where I worked. He was a little bit earlier than I was by about a year or two. But, you know, by all accounts, from people I know personally that know him well, he has, is of the highest moral character and integrity. And I think the timeline that your caller laid out does miss a number of important steps um, before Mr. Mueller was actually appointed to uh, be the special counsel and obviously so selected by Rod Rosenstein, not um, Donald Trump, obviously. So I think there's a number of steps that are missed in the analysis. Have you ever met uh, Bob Mueller? I have not, personally, I have not. Did you know uh, Rod Rosenstein? I did not. I did not. Both, uh, you know, I'm, I'm speaking only through reputation, um, but I do know a lot of people that know him, and I, and I have a lot of respect for the people that I'm referring to in my head. Do you know any of the attorneys that are currently on that, that Mueller team that's working on this probe? Yeah, I do know several of them, and, you know, from my experience with them, they're also a very high moral character and uh, really are doing things as career prosecutors do because there's law and facts, and that's it, and wherever the evidence leads them. What do we know uh, about how they do that job? Where they work out of? Are, are they in D.C.? Are they in that courthouse in Alexandria, in Virginia? Uh, give us a sense of a, a day for them. Yeah, so they're here in D.C., the, the special counsel's office is. Um, a day for them, I'm speculating a bit because we don't know a whole lot. I bet you it's early and runs late. I can tell you Mr. Mueller is notorious for having uh, very, very early meetings when he was at my office. Um, a good friend of mine was uh, reported to him directly, and I will tell you that when you walked into Mr. Mueller's office, you better have your ducks in a row. It's about a three- or four-minute meeting that you better make your points. If you're wrong, you, you, you're going to regret it, and if you're right, you better be able to back it up. It's a no-nonsense atmosphere. Maxine in New Baltimore, Michigan, Independent. Good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for taking my call. In respect to uh, this uh, Cohen and Manafort uh, uh, case, I look at this as two little parts of a jigsaw puzzle. This whole mess in Washington uh, frightens me. It really, really frightens me that uh, these people with the power can force people to do what they want them to do to obtain their end, which is to impeach and get rid of Trump and uh, negate millions of people's votes. That is frightening to me. If they can do that to these people who have uh, money, like Manafort and Cohen, 
in their millions. What will they do to average uh, lunchbox Joe or Jane, like myself? Maxine, is it, is it the special counsel that, that you don't trust specifically, or is it the entire Justice Department? The entire Justice Department. Everything that is going on, it's plain on the face, you know, it is plain that they What are, do you think of the, the Attorney General Jeff Sessions? Uh, he's, he's, he's not doing anything, you know, really. In what way? Uh, I don't know. I don't know why he's uh, uh, silent. But uh, it's frightening what's going on in our country. It really is frightening to me as just a plain uh, citizen uh, who's watching all of this and seeing it. Yeah, I mean, that's a sentiment that even by polls is in 30 to 40 percent of the country. So it's a voice that's out there and it's one that you know, everybody has to recognize. And of course, Mr. Trump relies on in large part, you know, I guess part of my comment would be is, you know, we haven't seen all the evidence. You know, I, I will just tell you that we are seeing the tip of the iceberg of what Bob Mueller actually has. So I, you know, with all respect to the callers and the people out there that you know, are part of that 30 or 40 percent, I would ask to hold judgment and to see what is actually there. And if it's at the end of the day, the evidence isn't there, it's my opinion that the case won't be brought. But, you know, just in one last thought is, you know, what would your caller and others talk about today about Richard Nixon? Was he, you know, wrongly indicted or, or as an unindicted co-conspirator? Was he, you know, objectified? Was he unfairly treated? Or was it a person who, you know, stepped away from the office because he was about to be impeached for righteous reasons? And if, if, the, if the people will agree that that was a righteous um, a series of events based on the conduct, Hold judgment here. How concerned is the Justice Department, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, uh, an assistant U.S. attorney, how concerned are they about public trust in the justice system? A hundred percent. I mean, uh, morale is not good. You know, to have the leader of the country, the leader of the Justice Department, every day calling the Justice Department a witch hunt. You know, specifically identifying prosecutors and, and agents and, and um, you know, the attorney general himself and calling them not men and degrading them this way. I mean, I would, you know, I just suggest that if you thought about where you worked every day and if your boss came in and treated, you know, your senior staff, you individually, how would that be an environment to work? But the good news is, is that I believe that those line prosecutors, those, you know, career prosecutors will and agents will follow the law, follow the facts and take it where they where it leads them. Give you one more call. Daniel's been waiting a while in Chicago, line for Democrats. Go ahead, Daniel. Good morning. I, I find this comical, that this is totally ridiculous, that I have to sit here and know that 40% of America is this backwards. They act like they don't see that this man lies to them every day, changes his story left and right, degrades his own Justice Department when they don't do what he expects them to do, which is cover up for him. It's cri everything he does is criminal. Everybody around him is criminal. Face the facts. The man is a criminal, and he's lying to you. No matter how you voted, you are destroying this country by supporting someone who is criminal. Seth Waxman, give you the final 30 seconds. Yeah, I mean, that's the other 60 to 70 percent of the country, isn't it? And, you know, today you have Mr. Trump out there saying that people who flip are criminals. And it's the people like Paul Manafort who are standing tall that are doing the right thing. I mean, that is backwards. There is no justification for a statement. That is a statement coming from a criminal defendant, in my mind. That's someone that's facing in the crosshairs, not a president of the United States. And just, I guess my last kind of analogy I'll give for the day, that is Tony Soprano or Michael Corleone, a mob boss talk that people who flip are rats. Michael Cohen accepted responsibility, pled guilty under oath before a federal judge. That's how this country works. That's how this system works. And for a president to degrade that and, and make light of it and essentially call it illegal is a shame. Seth Waxman, a former federal prosecutor, now works uh, at a firm here in Washington, D.C. Appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Up next on the